Matthew chapter 11. And we'll look at uh, 20 through 24. Matthew chapter 11, 20 through 24. Then Jesus began to denounce, whoopsie, there goes my bookmark. Then Jesus began to denounce the towns. That's uh, maybe a little disconcerting. And we were talking in Sunday school class today how so often we, we read a passage and we, we're kind of used to it and we zip by it without thinking about it. Then Jesus, remember the guy who carries the little lamb around and he's, he's wonderful? The guy who's knocking at the door to your heart and says, I want to eat with you, let's do life together. Jesus began to, den to denounce the towns in which he did his ministry, in which he performed most of the miracles. Why? Well, because they didn't repent. When God comes into our life, when God presents truth, my, the thing I should be doing is getting on my knees and repenting. Not making excuses or saying, well, this is just the way Dan is, you know. I need to be getting, I need to orient myself according to God's reality because God's reality is reality. So Jesus began to denounce the towns in which he had uh, performed most of his miracles. He said, woe to you, Chorazin. And that's just a little town. Woe to you, Bethsaida, another little town. If the miracles that were performed in you had performed in Tyre and Sidon, which were these big Phoenician, Canaanite cities, uh, Tyre, Sidon, and then Carthage. You ever heard of the Punic Wars between Rome and Carthage in northern Africa? Carthage was a Canaanite city way over there in Africa that came from, from the Phoenician people. Uh, they, if the same miracles had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, those people would have repented long ago. Now, I want you to think. You're sitting in, uh, well, these are nice cities. These are nice towns, Chorazin, Bethsaida. They're country, country towns. They're not big places. They're not dens of iniquity. <laughs> nice country towns, salt-of-the-earth kind of people. They have synagogues all over the place. They have the Old Testament. They're trying to worship God. And Jesus takes these major metropolitans, big places, renowned for sin and idolatry, and he says, you guys are worse than those guys. That should shock you because I'm, I'm guessing you've read this before and I'm guessing it didn't shock you because you read it too fast. Jesus takes these nice country town villages and says, if the miracles performed in you would have been performed in those big metropolitan heathen uh, bastions of wickedness, they would have repented a long time ago. In sackcloth and ashes, they would just rent their clothes and said, oh, Lord God, they would have been distraught with their sin. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. By the way, the Canaanites, including the Carthaginians that fought Rome, you know what Rome accused them of doing? Sacrificing their children to their gods, just like the Old Testament does. The Old Testament says the Canaanite people were sacrificing their children to their gods. It would be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the Day of Judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, do you guys think you're going to be lifted up to skies? you think you got it all together? No, you will go down to the depths. I don't think Jesus was doing that win friends and influence people thing very well. I'm reading this and I'm thinking, Jesus, you're doing it wrong. That, that's not what you tell your audience, especially country folk, because country folk know they're better than city folk. I mean, it's just a given. Uh, and so he's talking to these nice people and saying, you think you're going to be lifted up? I'll tell you, no, you're going down to the depths. If the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, what? It would have, it, the city of Sodom would have remained to this day. But I tell you that it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. And here we get this idea of uh, there's heaven, there's hell, but in hell, it's not like everybody's got the same degree of punishment. There are worse punishments. Uh, there's degrees of punishment. Several points real quick. Uh, John chapter 1 tells us that 
Jesus is full of grace. Jesus is full of grace. Wherever he goes, he's a gracious person, meaning he wants, he has, his, he has your best interests in heart. He wants to give you, Jesus doesn't want to get you what you deserve. God, give me what I deserve. He wants to give you much more than we deserve. He wants to give us blessings that we don't deserve. But John says he's full of grace and truth. He's full of grace and truth. Grace and truth. Grace and truth. And we need truth to understand why we need the cross. If we didn't have sin, you think Jesus would have died on that cross? No. He died because we're lost, a world of lost sinners. And in this passage, we see Jesus is not, he's not full of hate. He's not full of bitterness. You people rejected me. Well, you can all go to hell. That's not what he's saying at all. He's full of discernment, wisdom. He sees things the way they are. People in those villages, although he was love incarnate, they were pretty satisfied with religion that builds them up, a religion that tells them they're better than non-religious people, religion that tells them they're better than the Romans and the Greeks and everybody else. They were really satisfied with their culture. We're country folk. And they looked down at the people that Jesus said, if, they, if I came to them, they would have repented. People are rejecting Christ. That's the reality in Christ is not full of bitterness. He's saying, listen, guys, you think you're going to be lifted up? You think you're all that? No. You will be brought down to the depths. And in the Old Testament, what do we say when we took several years going through the Old Testament? God's perspective and our perspective are different. We expect he's going to do one thing, and God always comes at it from a different angle. Nobody other than God would have God incarnate, God in flesh, would have given that kind of message that Jesus just gave. Think about it again. Tyre and Sidon, Canaanite cities up north of there, godless Gentiles. In Sodom, about 100 miles south, Sodom was destroyed by fire and brimstone by God. God says, okay, time's up. God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom today, even people, the, the term Sodom is still a symbol of wickedness. The Old Testament tells us that the city was sexually immoral. They were stunningly selfish. It was all about them. Some people come into town, they try to chase after them and, and rape them. They, they just thought about themselves only. And the Old Testament tells us that the people were proud and they were cruel to the poor. I mean, and the needy and the hurting. How low is it to find somebody who's lower in suffering in life and then twist the screws on them? The Bible says they were sexually immoral, they were selfish, they were full of pride, and it says that they had an ex, uh, an, what do you say, an excess? Too much food. Excess, thank you. They had an excess of food. I spelt it wrong in there and it wouldn't come to my brain. They had an excess of food, uh, and yet they didn't have compassion on those who were suffering. Contrast these major metropolitan cities with these tiny country villages, places where they've got the scriptures, where people worship God. Which places would you, which places would you naturally think God would be more critical of? Think about it. Which places would you think God would be more critical of? Yeah, me too. City, whoa. Another insight we get out of this section is that people uh, won't necessarily trust God and love him just because they see miracles. Has anybody ever told you that? People say that all the time. Well, if I could see these miracles, then I'd love God. I always tell them, no, you wouldn't. Well, what do you mean? I said, look at the, in the, Jew, the, the Hebrew children in the Old Testament. They, they were being fed miraculously during the entire time, the exodus and the wandering, and they were still rebelling against God. Saw the pillar of fire, saw the plagues that brought them out of Egypt. Miracles don't cause us to love. 
God knows this. You know how we know God knows this? Because when Jesus came, he could have just, no hungry people on the planet. No, uh, no uh, people with physical handicaps on the planet. No illnesses on the planet. No demons on the planet. Instead, he went place to place healing those who came to him in person. Personal. Think about it. If God, if all God had to do is heal a bunch of people or feed the world or maybe right across the sky, I've had people tell me, if he's God and he wants us to believe, why don't he just right across the sky, I'm God, hey guys, I'm God, start praying. Well, you know, there's two ways to answer this. One way is God's told us that in the end times, he will come down in glory and the nations will tremble. They're not necessarily going to fall down at their feet because they love him. They're going to be scared. So that's not necessarily the way to, for God to win our hearts. Others have said, why doesn't he just put a big giant billboard on the moon? Then we would all know he's real. Yeah, right. You know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be 30 seconds before somebody's on CNN saying he's an alien. Uh, you know, if, there, if there's this big sign on the moon saying, worship me. Uh, or people would grudgingly believe, okay, he's a god, but he may have created us, but he made us sentient people with our own will and determination. Who is he to tell us what to do? And they would come up with all these reasons why even if God's real, they shouldn't have to obey him. So just throw out that idea that if there was just miracles all over the place, everybody would love God. Uh, in fact, when, uh, when atheists have said that to me, uh, when atheists have said to me, Dan, if he wants us to, to, to believe in him, why did he do all these miracles? And I'm say, and I'm saying, uh, well, you need to think about that because do you really believe that you would just fall in love with him and thank him for the cross and start confessing your sin if he declared himself? And a lot of times they'll immediately come back, I would not uh, love him even if he were a peer right before me, which is, of course, the point, isn't it? And God knows that. How about free cash? Everybody loves somebody with free cash. Uh, lots of people, if Jesus just popped up and he was like this ATM but, but it lim unlimited, a lot of people would come running and you know what? They'd say whatever he wanted them to say. Sure, I believe in you. Yeah, check. Oh, I'm so sorry for my sins, <laughs> you know. Uh, free cash. He could get a crowd with free cash. Uh, magic healings, same thing. There's, it's easy to get a crowd uh, for Jesus. But, you know, deep down inside, you know these things wouldn't work. These things wouldn't work. You can't scare someone into loving you, and you can't buy love. Don't we know this? then why do we pretend like all he should do is scare us into faith or, or, or uh, buy, it, buy our affections? We know it doesn't work that way on a human level, and guess what? God made us in his image, and he's a relational God, and he wants, to he wants us to come to him in a faith relationship. You know, we all know this classic story. You've seen it time and again. I've seen, I've seen this story in, in Japanese, English, and Korean classic story where a guy is secretly rich, but he's looking for a wife, right? You know the story, but he doesn't want all the gals to know how well off he is because then they're only going to appreciate him for his wealth. So he doesn't reveal all his wealth right away because he wants to find somebody who will love him for who he is. It's a storyline that we all get. Well, Jesus, Prince, Prince of Peace, he never lied about that. He says, God is my father. In fact, he, he performed miracles to point people towards who he is. Miracle means sign. This is a sign who I am. He called God his father. The Bible calls him the king of kings. But he didn't go around buying votes either. He didn't go around buying votes because he knew that human hearts are fickle. He knew that just giving people stuff doesn't result in faith. There's another way to test this. The United States, based originally... Uh, based on many things that were Christian principles, had a long history of strong faith in our culture, the richest nation of Christians that the world has ever seen by far. And then you can take Christians in persecuted places or Christians in lands facing poverty, and guess what? They're more likely to give 10% of their income than Christians in the richest nation, Christian nation in the world. More likely to read their Bibles. 
Apparently, God blessing us with wealth has not resulted in this huge revival in the United States. Right? I mean, this is making sense, right? People who will follow you only for what they can get, guess what? They're not really loving you. They're loving the stuff they can get. Now, God is our Heavenly Father. And as our Heavenly Father, He delights in giving His children good gifts. And He says, if you have any prayer, any request, any petition, give it to me. God's happy to hear our prayers. And you need help financially, you need help with health, you need help... Of course we pray. We have a God who loves to hear us come to him in faith. But you know, he's not going to buy us off with cheap tricks, with parlor tricks. That's actually what the Antichrist is going to try. You're going to get a lot of people that way. People that will follow you only for what they can get don't really love you. They love the things they can get. God says, I'm good. I'm goodness. I'm gentle, I'm kind. Wisdom comes from God. Love, joy, peace, all these things. And God says, let that stir your heart. Let your heart fall in love with goodness. Be a part of my plan. He says, this is how I am. This is how my children, I want my family to be like this. Be patient with one another. Forgive one another. Be generous. Take care of one another. God says, this is who I am. Love me because I love you. And I want my family to look like this. In our families, this is the way we do things. That's the way God wants us to be. Next, uh, we're going to read some of the most amazing words that were ever spoken on the planet Earth. And no exaggeration. Look at from verse 25. At that time, Jesus says, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. So he's talking about these cities, the little towns where he was being, where, where people had the, the synagogues and they had the religious thing going. They were talking about the one and only God. And God turns around, he, Jesus condemns them, and he turns around and says to his father, Lord God, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you've hidden these things from the wise and the learned. You've revealed these things to little children. These guys that think they're all that, that are so proud of their wisdom, God, they don't get it. But you've revealed this to simple people of faith. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Oh, so only people who, who Jesus chooses can... Well, who does Jesus choose? Well, let's look at the next verse. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. You know what? I had some good teachers growing up. I never had a math teacher who said that. <laughs> Come to me, everybody who's weary and heavy burdened, whose soul is worn down, who life is just bearing down on them, who you're filled with guilt, and the guilt is just, just come to me and I'll give you rest. I never had a science teacher, had some good science teachers, never had any history teachers. You know, I've read uh, the words of Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha. I've read uh, Confucius and, and uh, Lao Tzu, uh, Muhammad, read the Quran. You know what? Nobody else says this. Nobody else talks like this. These people who were, who were full of their religion, Jesus said, you think you're going up? You're not going up. He turns around. He says, if you're heavy laden, if you're broken, boy, this is sounding a lot like the Sermon on the Mount, isn't it? Where the very first thing was confessing our spiritual brokenness is our key to relationship with God. He says, if you are weary and heavy laden, well, who does, who's disqualified now from coming to Jesus? People who think they're okay. He says, if you are weary and heavy laden and you have this burden on you, come to me, come to me. Why, he's, he's, this is God pleading, why stay away? Why? Come to me, 
Everyone who's weary and burdened, I will give you rest. Take my yoke, my teaching, my way of life, my agenda upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for yourself. The only person who can say, I am humble, is either an incredibly humble person who can just say, call it like it is. Like, like uh, Carl Lewis, when he was the fastest man in the world, it was not pride for him to say, I'm the fastest man in the world. That's just the way it is. Jesus can say, I'm humble. Because his ego is not bumping up against other people's. He's not easily offended. His ego wasn't the issue here. He said, I am gentle and I'm humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. Take my way of life on you. Boy, it's better. It's easier. You're going to find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Isn't Jesus good? Life's hard. Feel like you can't take another breath sometime, another step. Have you ever felt so burdened by heaviness or depression or just loss of dreams that even taking a step up the stairs, things not working out sometimes? Or maybe, honestly, I've been here. I've been in places, you know, where my, I've just had my life is so blessed that everywhere I look, my life is blessed over here, my life is blessed over there. I'm blessed in so many ways I don't understand. I'm blessed, I don't, I don't deserve all this. I'm so blessed, and why am I having a hard time now being loving and kind and patient? And what is wrong with me when my life is so incredibly blessed? If, if you can't under, understand and, and appreciate and give thanks for the day in and the day out, if you can't love God in the usual days, what's going to happen if persecution comes or sickness, death? I want to learn how to glorify and honor God right here, right now, in the usual days. Day in, day out, the daily grind. Jesus says, come to me. Come to me. Lay your burden down. I will give you rest when you lay that burden down. Then take my yoke upon you. So we, we lay down our burden. Then secondly, we take Christ's way of life on us. He says, when you do that, that world, that world that uses people, eats them up, chews them up, spits them out, that world that only sees you as a dollar sign, that world that only values you as long as you can give something back, that world's way of seeing things, that's a heavy burden. Instead, take my yoke, take my teaching, my will upon you. And he says, because I'm gentle, I'm humble, you're going to find rest for your soul in me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. As a church, brothers and sisters, uh, you know, we're not the church we want to be, not by a long shot. And uh, sometimes I can beat myself up because, honestly, you had a better pastor, you'd have a better church. Uh, but if I had better people in my congregation, we'd be a better church too, you know. I mean, we're all falling short. And that's why we need grace for one another and patience for one another uh, we want foundation to be a place of rest for people's souls. If somebody's weary and heavy burdened, they're struggling with guilt, struggling with sin, I don't want them to come in here and have people look down at them. What about, what about sin that we don't want to have in our own families? When somebody comes in these doors, they better know they're loved. No matter what they're dealing with, no matter what they're struggling with, if they can't come to church, where can they come? We want this place to be a place where people can lay down their burdens. That means people who know they've got a burden. And we don't want to say, are you bringing that in here? Oh, give me a break. How ungodly. How, how hellish when a church is a place that looks down at people bringing burdens in. We need to be a place of rest and acceptance, a place where we can be real. Again, if you can't be real at church, where are you going to be real? 
I'm here because of that cross. That's real. We don't, we don't want to play religion where we come up and we all pretend to be something we're not. If we, as people, if, if I'm critical, and I can be, if we are critical, if we're judgmental, a judgmental church, a place where people get upset easily and then, and then hold on to grudges and let it fester a little bit, uh, we will be never, ever, ever be a safe place for somebody to confess their sins. I can't confess my sins because what will people think? Maybe that's the workplace. It shouldn't be the church. Let's have a place where it's okay. The most powerful words in the English language are not I love you. Those, I think, are second most powerful. The most powerful words in the English language because they're so supernatural is I'm sorry I acted like a horse's hind end. Well, the second part, not necessarily. I'm sorry in meaning it, right? We got that? I'm sorry I was a jerk. I'm sorry I blew it. I'm sorry the way I spoke to you. And then you can even say, you know, I still think you were wrong. <laughs> if you do. But the way I treated you, I know is wrong. And I'm not proud of it. We need to be a place where people can confess. Because how can we ever grow spiritually unless we can confess? We grow up and we mature as we confess. Church needs to be a safe place to say, I'm wrong. There is so much freedom that comes from repenting. The Bible says times of refreshing come with repentance. Refreshing when you, it's just so hot and so humid and you jump in that pool and that's refreshing. That's like the Holy Spirit coming over us when we just, we let go of it. We, we've been trying to defend our actions. We've been trying to make excuses. We've been trying, yeah, but, yeah, but, and pointing at other people. And God says, let me deal with them right now. Your attitude, your heart is wrong. You say, Lord. I'm wrong. I need grace. Whoosh, time refreshing. Just wash over us like, like, like a pool on a hot, sticky day. So much freedom that just comes from letting go. Stop fighting with God. When, when God came to the apostle Paul before he was Paul, he was Saul, and he was on his road to Damascus, and he was going to go. He's going to Damascus, remember why? To persecute Christians, Right? And Jesus came and said, why are you persecuting me? And he says, well, who are you? And then he says, why are you fighting against me? And isn't that where we often find ourselves spiritually when we're trying to excuse our sin or, make, or, or excuse our, our, uh, all the things going on in our life? It's like we're fighting with God, and it's such, such a relief to, to put the fist down and say, okay, God, you win. No longer justifying, just coming clean. Brothers and sisters, friends, have you accepted Christ's offer? He says, come to me, everybody who's weary and heavy burden, and I will give you rest. Again, who's the person who was never going to lay their burden down? A person who thinks they have no baggage. They deny that they're carrying around any baggage. A person who, because of pride maybe, won't let Christ help them, or a person who thinks that Jesus just can't help. All three of these things are people trying to live in the flesh in self-righteousness, not in trusting God and relying on him. Brothers and sisters, friends, we, uh, why would we turn our backs on a God who loves us this much? You're carrying around a lot of guilt, lay it down. A lot of worry, a lot of pressure about the future, let it go. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Jesus taught these, this principle in the scriptures that those who are forgiven much love much. When we can come to a point in our life when we say, boy, Lord God, forgive me, it will stir up in our hearts a love for God and the things of God, and we're going to love God's people. That's why we don't throw other Christians under the bus at other churches or Christians who do things differently. We don't throw them under the bus because they're God's children too. And God's loving them and working on them and you know, we're right and they're wrong. We all get that. Uh, that's a joke. Every church, every church should think that they're right. Every church should be convinced that they're doing things the right way, right? But also, let's have grace to let other Christians do things differently. Because we're all saved, not because of our great 
deeds we've done, but we're saved by grace. We're all on our knees together around the cross. So I'm not quick to write off people in other churches and people who say that they're Christians. That's not my job. Look at from uh, verse 28. You can read that again. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. Jesus says, I'm gentle and I'm humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Am I ready to learn? If I'm ready to learn, that means that implies willingness to change, willingness to grow. If I'm ready to learn, that means I need to move from where I'm at here to, to a different place tomorrow. That heavy load that can weigh us down and hurt our backs, a lot of times we can identify that with ourselves. This is who I am. I'm an angry person. This is who I am. I have a trouble with alcohol. This is who I am. I'm self-righteous. This, this is who I am. I'm just critical. And so we take the burden and we make it a part of ourselves. We take this burden and, and we place it on our, on our backs. And then how can you set down a burden when you say, well, I'm a guy. This is just the way I am. What does that do? That keeps the burden squarely on our backs. Because there's no confession there. There's no willingness to change. We need to be able to take that burden. I once heard a story about a traveler, and uh, he's going along a, a dirt road. Maybe he's going to the farmer's market or something. He's got this big burden on his back, and he's just going like this. And he's just carrying it. It's so heavy, and it's hot, and he, he's sweating, and he's just, oh, he's never going to make it. He, he ain't going to make it. And, and he's just, and he hears clip, clop, clip, clop, clip, clop. And he looks, he looks by him, and this guy's coming by, and looks over there and they kind of nod at each other and he's walking along and the guy kind of with the horse in the wagon starts to slow down a little bit. He says, uh, you want to hop on? I'm going to the farmer's market. Oh, yeah. That'd be really great. This is way, this is really quite a burden. It's too much for me. And I don't know. Farmer's name is probably something like Rutherford or something. And and the guy up front, what, what's your name? He just says JC. He didn't really say the full name. And so he's, he's got his wagon, and JC's riding along with the horse. And behind him, he hears, oh, oh, man, my back's killing me. He looks back there. The guy's standing in the back of the wagon <laughs> with his burden like this. And he says, what, what are you doing? He says, well, I can't let you do all the work. I, I got to carry my own burden. I got to take responsibility for my own weight. I want to get there, but I want to, I, want to, I, want, I want to earn it myself. I'll accept the free ride, but I'm going to do the rest myself. You know, it's funny because in reality, nothing that guy does helps him get to the farmer's market any easier. His destination isn't arrived at any faster, but guess what? He's making life hard on himself, isn't he? He's making life hard on himself. Because even though he's taking the free ride, he's not putting down that burden. Brothers and sisters, have you been there? I've been there. I believe in Jesus. He died on the cross for my sin, but I'm still carrying around. And Jesus says, what are you doing? Well, I don't want you to do all the work, Jesus. So you died on the cross and bled and gave you a perfect sinless life, and I'm going to add another 5% by feeling really miserable about everything. And Jesus says, I want you to have peace. I want you to have life abundantly. Joy. Last thought. We said earlier that we want to be a church where people can lay their burdens down. But another question for, for me and for all of us here is, are we trying ourselves to be safe places for people to hurt? Can people be less than perfect around us in our homes? in the workplace, neighbors, sometimes like drastically less than perfect. According to scripture, we're all broken, pastors too. 
And when broken people do things that broken people do, sometimes it ain't pretty. And that can break friendships, divide churches, and ruin marriages. There's never been a church split without sin involved. There's never been a broken friendship without sin involved. 1 Peter 4.8 tells us, most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other because love covers a multitude of sins. Well, you don't know my husband. He's not just a sinner. He's a sinner. Well, love covers a multitude of sins. I'm so tired of the people at church, the way they look at me or the way they talk about me. Or I'm so tired of the, the pastor ignoring me. Or I'm so tired of, of uh, being looked over and not respected. Take a breath. Love covers a multitude of sins. You get filled up with love, start really caring about other people, we don't get offended so easy. Hebrews 12, 15, see to it that no one misses the grace of God. See to it in the church. Come on, guys. Nobody should miss this grace. And that no bitter root grows up. Because when a little bit of bitterness starts growing, it's like, it's like a plant that's in my driveway, you know. They grow bigger and they kind of make that crack a little bitter, bigger. See to it that no bitter root grows up, causes trouble, and defiles many. One person harboring bitterness in a family or a church can break up the concrete, break things up for all of us. See to it that we don't forget grace. We take grace and we extend grace. We receive grace from God and we give grace to one another. And if we're harboring bitterness, then we're the devil's tool wherever we're at. Raise your hands if you want to be the devil's tool. Don't raise your hand. I don't want to see it. Sometimes we are, but we don't ever want to be, right? Instead, we want to be like Jesus. In fact, we're called to be, God's going to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. We want to be more and more like Jesus. The, the early, the non-Christian world called believers, followers of Christ, they call them Christians. Christians means little Christ. We're supposed to look like Jesus. We're supposed to carry one another's burdens, the Bible says, the way Jesus carries ours. In this way, you fulfill the law of Christ, according to Galatians 6.2. If we're learning to be like Christ, then we're going to learn to be a safe place. We'll bear each other's burdens. We'll be become, look at this, Jesus says, I am gentle and humble. I want to be known as a gentle person. Got to work on this humility thing. Don't want to ever stop working on it. I want to be like Jesus. And Jesus says, you start doing things my way, you take my yoke upon you, life gets easier. Life is going to be easier, the burden's going to be lighter, life is going to be better, life is going to be blessed. Amen. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Jamesville Athletic Club.